recording. Okay, we're now recording. So today's lecture is a very brief look at some of the physics involved in welding. Um, yesterday, we introduced welding processes. We looked at arc welding, laser welding, electron beam welding, and uh, solid state friction welding. And we looked at them in terms of the way you get the heat in, uh, the way the, the need or otherwise to protect the material from the atmosphere, the way you introduce filler material, um, and the characteristics of the welds they make. Today, we're just going to step back and look at some of the physics. It's a very simple overview, so it won't take very long, um, just to give you a feeling for some of the things that are going on. So today, we will first of all start thinking about something we call power density, which tells you a lot about a welding process. We'll then have a look at some of the things that influence the behaviour of the pool of molten metal that you, cre you create in a conventional arc weld. We'll have another little look at laser and electron beam welding, a little bit more at the physics of what's going on. And then we'll summarise it. So this is going to be quite short. Um, it's, it's just a function of how we break up the material in the course. So the first thing we want to think about is something called power density. Now, if you've got a hairdryer, now typically a hairdryer might be a 1.5 kilowatt device. You know, it's drawing about six or seven amps from a 240 volt supply. Um, if you take your hairdryer and you find a piece of stainless steel sheet um, or even a stainless steel plate like that one we stuck the friction stir head in yesterday, and you basically point the hairdryer at the um, stainless steel sheet. And that hairdryer is transferring 1.5 kilowatts to the sheet. So that's 1.5 kilojoules per second of energy and maybe over a 50 millimeter diameter spot once the air is spread out a bit. And of course that stainless steel plate does not melt and we would be astonished if it did. Um, but as you would expect, it does not melt. Um, but if you do exactly the same thing uh, with the same plate, you strike an arc between a tungsten electrode and the plate. And this is gas tungsten arc welding, which we talked about yesterday, say. And typically that will be 10 volts across the system. Uh, typically it'll be drawing 150 amps current. And of course, the plate melts, forms a weld pool. But actually, the power is exactly the same. It's still 1.5 kilowatts. The amount of heat you're transferring to the plate per second is exactly the same. So why does it melt in one case and not melt in the other? And the answer, of course, is that it's not just the power, it's the power density. It's the area or the volume over which that power is being introduced. So in welding, if you talk about the welding power per unit area, because if you tend to be looking down on the top of a pair of plates that you're joining and you'll be striking an arc between an electrode of some sort and that surface. And so what you're interested in is the cross-sectional area into which that energy is introduced. And the higher the power density, the smaller the cross-sectional area that the power is going in at. So if the power density is too low, in other words, you're putting it in over too big an area, then actually that heat flows out faster than you can get it in, significantly faster than you can get it in, is one way of looking at it, or certainly as fast as you can get it in through conduction, and you don't need to push the temperature up underneath the hairdryer very much in order to be able to transmit all the heat out into the rest of the plate through conduction. So basically, you're putting in heat over an area and at a rate that allows it to be conducted away from that volume under the area as fast as it goes in without raising the temperature by very much. So if you remember when you 
do calculations on heat flow, the heat flow along a rod is a function of the cross-sectional area of the rod, the thermal conductivity and the temperature difference between the beginning and end of the rod. That's sort of A-level physics. And so what this is saying is there's enough cross-sectional area around the area that you're putting the heat in to conduct all that heat away into the rest of the plate without having to have a particularly big temperature rise underneath the hairdryer to drive that heat flow. So that's what happens if your power density is too low. If the power density increases, so say you strike a welding arc, then you find you can melt it. You can form a weld pool. If you really go bananas and hit it with a laser or an electron beam, as we saw yesterday, the power density is so high that you can vaporize it. You don't just melt it before the heat flows away. You actually vaporize it and you end up with a keyhole. So that's down to power density. It's the amount of energy, the power per unit area that your process is putting in to the workpiece. And power density is quite useful because the power density of your welding heat source actually affects um, things other than the amount of it that you melt. And when you plot power density against uh, what we've got there, the power densities and the total heat input to the workpiece. So down on the X axis, we've got the heat source power density, watts per square centimeter. But on the, the vertical axis, we have the total amount of energy that you will put into your structure in order to do your weld. So as the power density of the process goes down, you're putting a higher amount of energy into the total workpiece because it's flowing out uh, in order to make the weld. So you can see that laser and EB welding have a very low total heat input because they've concentrated everything into that keyhole. They've made the weld in a very compact area without losing very much heat to the rest of the workpiece. Arc welding is intermediate and gas welding is lower still. So what you'll find is if you make a weld with EB welding in a given thickness, you'll put in you'll tend to put in a lower total heat input, lower total energy into the workpiece than if you made it with an arc weld. And what you find is the damage you do to the workpiece tends to increase as the heat, total heat input to the workpiece goes up. But the other side is the higher the power density, that means you get more penetration. You can weld a thicker component with a single pass. You can do it quicker and your equipment costs a whole lot more. So if you remember yesterday, we saw that vacuum electron beam welding chamber, which is a fairly significant piece of kit. Um, you know, large high vacuum container that's, that's many feet square or many feet cubed. And then you can contrast that with a, a gas flame torch, which you might use to try and braze or low temperature weld something. One is much cheaper than the other. So high power density welding costs more, uh, is quicker, has higher capital equipment costs, but tends to do less overall damage, although it depends on what you're looking for in damage here. Whereas if you go the other way, low power density tends to increase damage, but it is cheaper. Okay, that's power density. And here are some typical power densities for different processes. So a gas flame is maybe 10 to the 6 watts per square meter. An electric arc is maybe 10 to the 8 watts per square meter. And you can see lasers and electron beam welds are much higher. And that means the way the heat gets into the, the workpiece to form the weld differs. If the power density is lower, you only melt, you don't vaporize which means that the way the heat flows is limited by thermal conduction away from the whirlpool and by convection within the whirlpool. Whereas 
uh, a laser or an electron beam weld, you punch a hole right through it, you vaporized it, and you formed a keyhole so the electrons or the photons can get all the way down to the bottom before giving up their energy without having to rely upon conduction or convection through the metallic substrate. So that's another feature of power density. Um, and here's a picture of what we call conduction mode welding. Um, here, the fused depth, the amount you melt, is determined by effectively by thermal conduction, although convection in the weld pool affects its shape quite significantly, as we'll see. The converse is keyhole welding, where you've, gen you've, gen you've generated a hole all the way through, and that keyhole is being sustained by the vapour pressure of the metal that you have vaporised due to the very high energy density. So you can see there are two very different shapes of weld that you will produce. And we saw that, I think, in the electron beam weld uh, introduction yesterday. Now we have the process. There's another parameter which you will see um, if you ever get into doing calculations on welding. Um, and this is something called arc efficiency. Now the arc efficiency is basically one of these wonderful knockdown factors that engineers use. Um, it's the fraction of the electrical power that's actually transferred to the workpiece. So in an arc welding kit, you've got an electrical power, it's V times I, but not all of that V times I is actually going to get into the workpiece and melt the substrate. Some of it will be lost by radiation, some of it will be lost because you've got a plasma um, and some of the heat in that plasma ends up going elsewhere rather than into the workpiece. So you have this knockdown factor that says, OK, I'm consuming this much electrical power, but not all of it is going into the workpiece. Um, and it's an important parameter when you want to model heat flow in welding, if you ever get on to looking at that, because you need to know how much of the electrical power is going into the workpiece and making it heat up. If it's dissipating into the welding cell somewhere, uh, if you can feel it on your skin because of radiation from the welding arc, then that's not getting into the workpiece. It's actually going and heating something else up. Um, the arc efficiency for gas tanks and arc welding is typically 60 to 80 percent. In other words, between 60 and 80 percent of the electrical power actually goes into to melting metal. Submerged arc welding, which you may remember from yesterday, where you strike your arc underneath that great big pile of granular flux, that has a much higher efficiency because you haven't got the ability to lose heat from the arc into the surroundings because you've actually got the flux there absorbing energy as well. But gas tanks and arc welding typically 60 to 80 percent. And of course, laser and electron beam welding uh, processes also have an efficiency because, as you saw from that video yesterday, not all the electrons that you fire at the workpiece actually decelerate within the workpiece. If you're running in penetration mode and you've got a keyhole all the way through, some of the electrons will zip straight out the other side and they'll heat up whatever target you've got to absorb them. So all welding processes are not 100% efficient. They can't get all the energy that you're consuming by electric, usually by some form of electrical power into the workpiece to heat it up. Um, so there's another another number there. Gas metal arc welding is 80 to 90 percent, slightly better than TIG. OK, so that's efficiency. The next thing we want to think about is weld pool behavior, because you are melting or melting and vaporizing material in order to join two components together. So it's actually quite important to understand what shape that pool of molten material is because that will determine exactly how you do things. Um, in conventional arc welding, uh, the convection currents play an important role in determining the shape of that fused zone. So what you find is the hottest liquid is immediately under the arc, which because that's where 
all the energy is impinging. And then the flow of liquid material in the well pool, the well pool convection, will determine how the arc heat is distributed. And here's two examples. One is, this is a very shallow well pool. Oh, you can see on the left, uh, it's a little diagram. So the arc is just above here. The energy is impinging on the surface. And here we have a flow that goes out along the surface, back, round and up. So you've got two convection cells like that. And this is the case where surface tension forces in the arc are the most important determinant of what direction the convection flow starts off in. You end up with a wide and shallow well bead. If, however, the electromagnetic forces are more significant than the surface tension forces, then what you tend to find is convection goes in the other direction, it goes down and back out. And that will tend to develop a very deep, a much deeper weld pool. Um, now, whether surface tension dominates or whether electromagnetic forces dominate is affected by the chemical composition of your material because the surface tension depends on the level of some of the impurities. If you've got a lot of sulphur in your steel, that can strongly affect, the amount of sulphur strongly affects the surface tension forces. And what that can mean in practice is that if you're trying to make a well between two plates and you're assuming that you're gonna get a well pool that shape, and in fact, because you've got too much sulphur in at least one of the plates you're welding, you get a well pool that shape, you can end up having made a well that doesn't fully penetrate all the way down. So you can find that you've melted the top, but not the bottom of two plates that are butting together. And you've got what's called a lack of penetration defect. You haven't made a completely fully penetrating weld. And it can get worse than that, because if you've got surface tension higher on one side than the other because one plate's got a different chemical composition to the other the whole well pool can wander across from one side to the other so you've got another reason for not making a well that joins the two plates correctly so it's actually quite important now surface tension effects are always there but they vary with the chemical composition Electromagnetic effects are greater at higher currents. So if you increase the welding current, you're more likely to get um, the, the deeper and less shallow and figure of eight is shaped weld pool. So there's something going on there to be aware of. The other thing that happens in the weld pool is the arc pressure, the electromagnetic arc pressure at higher welding currents actually pushes the surface of the weld pool down. Um, and the pressure is proportional to the square of the welding current. Um, so if you've got a welding current in excess of 200 amps, uh, you can end up having quite a significant depression. And that also can affect the shape of the weld, the final weld that you make. Um, which is what that final point is, is if you push it down in the middle, you'll affect the heat flow and therefore you'll affect the shape of the final weld bead. Okay, so that was arc welding where it's all molten and there you've got conduction and you've got convection going on. Now laser and electron beam welding, as you'll remember from yesterday, you can actually vaporize the molten metal. In other words, you, that, that takes a lot of energy because, of course, the heat of vaporization is quite high. Um, and the power density that you can get depends upon the optics and the power, uh, the optics of the system, not, not just the raw power. And if you can get a high enough vapor pressure, you can push the molten metal out of the way and form a keyhole, which means you can weld very deep, straight and narrow. And that keyhole this is another area where surface tension becomes important because that keyhole, uh, the, 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 the molten surface, which would normally want to flow downwards under gravity, uh, is to some extent stabilised by the surface tension forces, which are trying to minimise the length of surface that you're forming. Um, 
So surface tension helps to stabilize it um, and the vapor pressure helps also to maintain it. And this picture you saw yesterday, different shapes of laser and electron beam weld that you can get. You can do these in either conduction mode or keyhole mode. So A and B on the left, there you've not formed a keyhole. And so as a result, um, you've got a shape which is rather similar to what you might get from an arc weld. As you move to C, D, E and F, you're generating deeper and deeper keyholes until finally you're going all the way through quite dramatically. Um, and the depth of penetration increases with both the beam power, which makes sense because the more power you've got, the more energy you've got to melt and vaporize stuff. And also the power density, because the higher the power density, the more power, the small volume you've got that you can then use to vaporize stuff. Now, both of them can involve filler metal addition, but very often we don't use it. And in fact, one of the reasons people like the idea of electron beam welding, thick section welds, is that if you make the weld without filler, and then you go away and reheat treat everything, if you've done it right, you can pretend there's no weld metal there at all. Um, and you can then try and persuade your certification authority that you don't need to inspect it in service and save a lot of money. So the other thing to think about is these keyhole welds is you get low levels of something called butterfly distortion. Um, what that means, uh, and there isn't a picture here, we'll show it to you on another lecture, is if you think about the temperature distributions you get in something like this, if you made weld B on the left hand side, clearly the top of the plate would on average get much hotter than the bottom of the plate during that process. When the whole thing then cools down to room temperature, the top of the plate will contract more than the bottom of the plate because it has a higher temperature drop before it reaches equilibrium. And that will distort the plate so that the parent material on either side of that point B goes up like this. And we call that butterfly distortion. And we'll talk about that more in another lecture. OK, let's now have a quick look at laser beam welding. Um, you can get a keyhole between one and two millimetres depth per kilowatt of laser power. Uh, so you can actually get a single pass weld in material thicknesses above 15 millimetres. Um, uh, so it's quite useful for small, delicate components. Um, the limit is the um, scattering the laser beam uh, and the ionized metal vapor, the plasma that you form when you evaporate it, scatters it to some extent. So that's one limit. If you do laser welding in a vacuum, you can actually get a bit deeper because that helps you with dissipating the metal vapor and allows the keyhole to stay uh, stable for greater depths. The other thing you have to worry about for this kind of weld is that if you have too much molten material, it can get too heavy uh, for surface tension to hold and gravity will pull all the molten metal out of the bottom. And that's a problem if you weld in the position that you can see here, which we call 1G. If you weld down from above, clearly those two bits of molten material on either side of the beam, if they get too big, then their weight, the gravitational force on them, which seeks to make them flow downwards, can exceed the ability of surface tension to hold them onto the solid on either side. And then what you do is everything gloops out the bottom and you get big defects in the world. OK. One of the greatest challenges is getting the keyhole stable. Uh, if the keyhole is not stable, you end up with defects. Um, one way of doing that is to weld in what we call the 2G position. So that picture there on the left, we rotate it round so the, well, the laser beam is horizontal. And that means that the gravitational forces are not acting along the entire length of that very thin molten zone. They're acting across it. And that helps to stabilise the process. It stabilizes the molten weld pool, which means what you lose out of the back is just what the 
the laser or electron beam spatters out the back due to its kinetic energy. So basically there's a rotation occurs as thickness gets higher, uh, you'll reach a critical thickness where a laser weld or an electron beam weld has to be welded on its side in the 2G position so that gravity doesn't pull the molten material out of the joint before it has a chance to solidify. The other thing you can get is gas pores or blowholes, porosity, where it's very, very, can be very turbulent inside a keyhole. And if that turbulence lasts long enough that it starts to solidify while there's gas still entrapped in it, gas bubbles still entrapped in it, then you'll end up with defects. Uh, and that can be a real problem with this kind of weld. Um, when you're doing full penetration keyhole, it's often more stable than a partial penetration one. Um, it's, it's a simpler geometry. Um, and people do an awful lot of modeling on this kind of thing to try and understand how to make these welds stay together. Okay, a few words about electron beam welding. Um, as we saw yesterday, it's much more powerful than laser welding. Um, we can weld 200 millimeter wall thickness in a single pass if we want to. Um, we have to do it in a partial vacuum or a high vacuum because that stops the electrons being scattered by um, ionizing the air between the gun and the workpiece to form a plasma and scattering itself in that plasma. So when we watched the example video of an 80 millimeter wall thickness weld being made in an electron beam chamber, even with that high vacuum chamber, you could still see where the electron beam was when it entered the plate, because we were ejected, we vaporized metal, uh, ejected it from the keyhole, and that ionized metal was glowing in the electron beam. But if you pump the vacuum down hard enough, it doesn't scatter the beam. One problem with electron beam welding, which laser welding doesn't have, is it's prone to magnetic deflection. Electrons, because they're charged, um, they will be affected by magnetism in steel components. Um, and if you're welding steels, you have to demagnetize them prior to welding, especially if they're thick. Um, because unfortunately, one of the ways that big bits of steel are moved around in mills often is with electromagnetic grabs. And what you don't want to do is to magnetize your steel plates, then try and weld them because the electron beam will wander off. And you may think you've made a nice thin vertical weld along that seam between two plates, but in actual fact, the beams wandered off to one side and you've got welding defects. So you have to degauss them before you weld them. And that's something you have to bear in mind. It's an, another cost associated with electron beam welding. Okay. Now, they're much more complicated, uh, but one of the things they offer is a significant productivity gain because you can do in a single pass what could have taken many passes. Um, that 80 millimeter weld we saw yesterday would have required 60 or 70 passes of gas tungsten arc welding to make it, which would have taken you weeks. Um, and instead we made it in a few minutes, uh, although we did have to wait to pump down the vacuum chamber for 20 minutes or so before we made it. Um, so there's productivity is important. The ability to make deep and narrow welds is important because that reduces distortion. And in some cases, actually allows you to make components using welding that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, so it's another process in your toolkit for making components of a particular type. If you, need, if, you, if you need a deep and narrow weld to join it and you need low distortion, then these could be the ones to go to. But they are expensive. Um, and because the equipment is much more expensive. Uh, you saw that huge EB welding chamber yesterday. Um, and there are practical limitations. You have to be much more careful. Um, so electron beam, electron beam welds, I think, produce X-rays when they decelerate. Um, the uh, laser light, you need to shield very carefully from that. So laser welding 
is often done in cells which are completely sealed, which have all sorts of safety interlocks. So if the robot points the laser in the wrong direction at the wall of the cell, everything trips. So you're talking about quite significant capital equipment and complexity to make these sorts of welds. Uh, whereas you can make a TIG weld or a MIG, we can make a MIG weld, a, a gas metal arc weld in your garage if you want to. Um, not the case for laser or electron beam welds. Um, but if you want to make a high integrity, low distortion weld, or uh, this is something to think about using. Okay, so this was a short lecture today. Um, we are only on 25.2. What we've looked at today, we basically looked at some aspects of the physics of um, arc welds, which is basically the um, uh, gas tungsten arc and gas metal arc, laser and electron beam welds. Uh, the take home message is there is an awful lot going on during fusion welding. Um, you've, we talked about uh, weld pool convection, we've talked about weld pool depression, and we've talked about keyhole formation. Um, we showed you metal transfer yesterday in gas metal arc welding. Um, now, understanding what goes on in the weld pool means you can understand all sorts of welding technologies and what we've done here is just giving you a picture of some of the things that are going on. Um, two very important things to think about are the heat source power and the heat source power density because those control what sort of welds you can make uh, and they also have an impact on how much undesirable distortion and damage you might put into the rest of the component while making that weld. So that's today's lecture, relatively short. Um, tomorrow we'll go on and have a look at welding metallurgy. Except it's not tomorrow, it's next Monday. Tomorrow, of course, we've got the um, drop-in session at 6 p.m. Uh, for anybody whose questions are not answered this evening today. So let me just um, drop back to there and stop recording.